We're going to begin with Kim Hildren as presenter for the first paper. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Great to see so many wonderful faces and real committed people to people with disabilities. Um, this presentation summarizes our paper, Transitional Benefits for a Subset of the Social Security Disability Insurance Population. And I want to thank my co-authors, first and foremost, who've joined me today, Pam Mazursky, Dean Harold Krent, and Dr. Jennifer Christian. Our paper addresses the small subset of new beneficiaries who the Social Security Administration currently identifies as expected to medically improve after a benefit award is made. Today, about 3% of beneficiaries are expected to medically improve. Examples include those who were in a catastrophic accident or who had major thoracic, abdominal, or reconstructive musculoskeletal surgeries. In other words, those with impairments arising out of conditions that respond well to medical and vocational treatment. These beneficiaries are not provided with medical supports or employment services that would facilitate their return to work should benefits be ceased through a continuing disability review, nor are they required to pursue rehabilitative or medical services to facilitate their return to work upon benefit award. In contrast, when Congress first considered adding a disability insurance component to the Social Security program, <clears throat> many contemplated a system of transitional benefits coupled with vocational services designed to get people back on their feet and into the workforce. Our paper encourages lawmakers to revisit the link between rehabilitation services and disability and consider creating transitional benefits for the small subset who, of new beneficiaries whose disability is not in question, but who have conditions expected to improve. The Social Security Administration would administer a compassionate system of transitional benefits with employment supports with the goal of employment, financial independence, and better quality of life. Beneficiaries with conditions that are expected to improve, as I said earlier, are not encouraged to work, nor are they provided with employment supports they need to return to work. Continuing disability review backlogs, which reach 1.3 million by the end of fiscal year 2013, harm beneficiaries, according to a report to the Bipartisan Social Security Advisory Board, by delaying return to work efforts, which become more difficult with time, potentially creating a misimpression that eligibility is permanent regardless of disability status, and preventing the Social Security Administration from taking timely action to discontinue payments to beneficiaries who are no longer eligible, causing misuse of program resources. Beyond backlogs, there are other problems facing the continuing disability review process. If the decision supporting the initial disability finding is vague, decision makers may not be able to determine medical improvement. In addition, beneficiaries face significant employment challenges given the length of time they wait for an award um, and in addition to the length of time before a continuing disability review occurs. And should they be ceased when a continuing disability review occurs, they are not offered services to help them re-enter the labor market. Our paper also references experts who have highlighted the need for beneficiaries to receive assistance to return them to employment, the value of work, and the increasing number of OECD countries that have implemented time-limited or temporary benefits. Briefly, our proposal for transitional benefits would change the dynamic of disability by First, ensuring that beneficiaries have access to supports and services that will aid them in medical work and recovery. Sending a clear message through a fixed length of benefit award that temporary financial support is needed while a beneficiary is recuperating, while also signaling the expectation that they will be returning to work. Allowing transitional beneficiaries to earn income without limit during the benefit period and finally, maintaining the beneficiary's ability to file a new application at the end of the transitional benefit period should they still believe they are unable to work. So under the proposal, DDS, and DDS examiners and ALJs would first determine, as they do now, whether the claimant meets the statutory definition of disability. 
Decision makers would use a newly developed predictive analytics model to determine whether the medical condition is expected to improve. If so, transitional benefits would be awarded for a two or three year period specified by the predictive model, with the decision maker having the discretion to expand the transitional period up to the maximum three year traditional term. As soon as practicable, contact information of individuals receiving transitional benefits would be sent to their community work incentive coordinators under the Work Incentive Planning and Assistance, or WIPA, program, which would be modified to prioritize services for transitional beneficiaries, including direct referral to a Ticket to Work service provider. Under a modified Ticket to Work program, Service providers will provide customized service to increase medical and or functional recovery, if necessary, in order to achieve employment. And as mentioned previously, there will be no cap on earned income during the transitional benefit period to encourage work. The paper further addresses a number of implementation issues regarding the use of predictive modeling. It points to SSA's experience with predictive modeling in the CDR process determining which mature diary cases should undergo a full medical review, SSA's need to update the guidelines to determine CDR diary designations as these were last updated in the mid-1990s, and a recommendation that the model predict the likelihood of medical recovery by leveraging key data, and finally that an expert panel be convened periodically to update the medical criteria used by SSA decision makers to determine medical improvement. Regarding appeals, we propose making the decision to award transitional benefits non-appealable to avoid undercutting the goal of encouraging the beneficiaries to take steps needed to re-enter the workforce instead of waiting for the appeals process to unfold. We point to examples where Congress has precluded appeals in analogous context in the past. As to supports, we provide further details regarding the expedited and tailored services through the existing WIPA and Ticket to Work programs and a study regarding amending the Rehabilitation Act. As to required compliance, transitional beneficiaries would also be required to follow prescribed treatment and take advantage of return to work services, if needed, to facilitate a workforce reattachment. SSA would also be required to notify transitional beneficiaries six months in advance of their benefits ending so that they may take any needed action. The paper includes a number of statutory changes required by the proposal as illustrated on the slide. Um, we were asked to provide these statutory changes, um, so I want to be sure that everybody knows that. Um, and also, oftentimes, even if you're talking about a pilot program, sometimes statutory changes are necessary. So this slide just highlights those statutory changes that would be needed. As far as intermediate steps, as requested, the paper includes some intermediate steps which could be considered. These include a study to analyze the CDR process to provide baseline data to inform a well-designed transitional benefit program, a congressionally authorized testing of all elements of the transitional benefit program through a pilot in a few states or a region, which could be expanded if pre preliminary results are positive, and then should Congress reinstate previ previously expired demonstration authority for return to work demonstrations, the paper includes options for demonstration projects through federal interagency agreements or state innovation or experimentation with state VR, DDS, and employment network partners, which could be funded by nonprofit foundations or through social impact bonds. With respect to questions and concerns, we address in the paper anticipated objections and concerns, including those who may oppose the concept of time-limited benefits. We believe that establishing transitional benefits for the small subset of beneficiaries whose conditions are expected to improve, combined with employment support services and the ability to earn unlimited amounts during their transitional benefit period, not only is a compassionate solution that better serves these individuals, but is also consistent with Congress's intention that some disabilities would be temporary, since the definition um, of disability specifies that disabilities must last for a continuous period of 12 months. We advocate the use of predictive analytics as a probabilistic approach that would ensure more consistent outcomes nationally. 
Um, we discuss administrative impacts um, as more applications might be processed due to those transitional beneficiaries who would reapply if they believe they continue to be disabled. However, we explain why we believe um, these costs would be manageable. And although the costs are speculative, we explain why we believe that any increase in administrative costs would be eclipsed in the long run through savings to the trust fund. We also discuss why additional funding for continuing disability reviews would not solve the issues addressed by this paper, including the fact that the transitional term, unlike the uncertain prospects of a CDR, reinforces the fact that these beneficiaries should be able to return to work and provides the supports to enable them to do so. In conclusion, the average SSI, SSDI benefit is $13,980 a year, only slightly higher than what constitutes the poverty threshold level for an individual living alone. We believe individuals with disabilities deserve far better outcomes that are consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act, namely the inclusion of individuals living with disabilities in all aspects of life, particularly employment. Thank you. We're now turning to Jason Fickner. Thank you, sir. You bet your friend. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. And again, thank you for the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget and for Congressman McCreary and Pomeroy for their efforts on this as well. Uh, it's very encouraging to see so many people turn out today uh, for this very important issue. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I'll probably skip over some things, but I want to do an overview of why we think this issue is important, what we're doing, and then some solutions. I also want to thank my co-author, Dr. Jason Seligman, who's here. Uh, he is currently with the Department of Treasury, but this work was started while he was at the Ohio State University, that not-so-good school just south of the great school, the University of Michigan. Uh, another disclaimer, these views represent our own, not the Mercatus Center where I work, or the Department of Treasury, or any person uh, past, present, future, living, or dead. They're just ours. Our contention and our concern is that the current program design of Social Security Disability Insurance is structured in a way that discourages work, and there is a view, a public perception, that it discourages and disincentivizes work. As you may know, you can work up to a substantial gainful amount, roughly a little over $1,000, but a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, and the program complexity confuses a lot of people. If they go over that SGA by a dollar, they could lose all their benefits. So there's a lot of complexity, a lot of concern, a lot of uncertainty about how to manage, uh, as a disabled person getting benefits, being able to work and how to go back to work. Uh, as you know, beneficiaries can try for up to two years to get benefits. They can apply, get rejected, appeal, go through a two-year appeal process where they tell the government over and over again, I cannot work, I cannot work, I cannot work. Then they get benefits. I mean, they get a little ticket in the mail that says, congratulations, you can work. And they're like, we're not that stupid. We're not gonna fall for this. So the incentives aren't there. So we're trying to change the incentives to basically encourage work, or at least not discourage it. Quickly, our reform proposals in a nutshell. We want to create temporary disability awards. Right now, it's all or nothing. You either are fully disabled and get benefits, or you are not and you get none. You can either work and not get benefits, or you can't work. Sorry, you can't work and get, and get benefits, or you can work and you don't get benefits. There's nothing in between. So you also want to allow for partial disability awards. The ability to have someone go and say, I might be able to work 20 hours a week, but I can't work 40. Uh, my disability prevents that. Could I get partial benefits uh, and stay attached to the labor force? We want to encourage partial disability benefits. We also want to engage employers. We realize right now that the incentives are not there for the employers necessarily to help, uh, especially for a lot of low-wage jobs. It's easier to dismiss people, help them get on DI or dismiss them, period, and not try to rehabilitate them. We want to change the incentives for employers so that they are engaged uh, as well. These reforms would recognize that disability is not an all or nothing condition. We want to support the return to work. We want to help maintain labor force attachment. It's also important to note that we recognize the use of pilots to detect effectiveness. When we were doing our research, talking to various people in this room as well, uh, former colleagues, it is amazing how over time we've done a lot of research on SSDI but still don't have a lot of evidence of what works, how it works, and for whom it works or may not work, um, which is why pilots are important. I think a lot of us want to do knee-jerk reactions and say, everyone should be go back to work. Uh, we should cut benefits. We should change the eligibility criteria. You know, one size does not fit all. In fact, one size fits none. 
Um, it's an old joke for those of us who work in Medicaid, and as you know, Medicaid basically is a state-run program with federal dollars that are matching. And the old joke is if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. When we started going through these reforms, we realized that not all of our reforms fit everybody. So the importance, again, of having pilots to test this. Um, again, the time for reform is now. I'm amazed. I'm the fifth speaker to go through, and we haven't seen a lot of charts showing the trust fund insolvency and the problems, so I get to do it. Um, this is the schedule. As you know, the solvency data is supposed to be for SSDI is 2016, more specifically the fourth quarter, which will time up really nicely with a presidential election and congressional elections as well. Um, I don't know how it works out that way, but it seems to be that was the timing of the trust fund insolvency. For those of you political scientists out there, this is what John Kingdon calls a policy window. Something has to happen. Current law means if no action is taken, benefits get cut by approximately 20%. No one in this room wants to see that. But that means Congress has to act to avoid it. That gives us a window to do improvements or reforms to the program that many of us think are needed in some way, shape, or form. Um, growth and disability, SSDI outlays, I'm going to do this very quickly, um, have grown rapidly. Uh, in fact, in the last 10 years, program costs have more than doubled. Uh, the number of disability beneficiaries, as you see, has increased for disabled workers quite rapidly as well. And there's discussions about what has caused this. Um, and scholars can debate this and actuaries can debate it. But it's one of several things that are happening. We obviously have the aging of the baby boomers that are contributing to enrollment. We have sometimes poor reset, uh, economic results and recessions, put people on the rolls. Women entering the labor force also has an issue as well. Um, and then back in 1984, we reduced, or sorry, we basically loosened the eligibility standards, which also put more in the role. So there's a lot of reasons why we've had growth in disability. But our termination rates have fallen. And as someone mentioned on the earlier panels, we now have basically less than one half of 1% are terminated for not meeting medical criteria. So basically, when you get on the program, you're likely to stay on the program and not return to work. Uh, we've also seen the rise of m mental musculoskeletal as being a main reason for people who get on the program. To put this more graphically, right now, over half of new awards are for musculoskeletal and mental. Um, the growth in DIs you see basically also corresponds with some recessions. You might notice in the late 70s there was a downtick in awards. This is back when Congress said we thought the benefits were too generous. We are going to tell SSA to basically be more stringent, do more stringent uh, CDRs. Uh, look more closely, don't look at labor force uh, market conditions in the area, and a lot of people dropped off the rolls or were taken off. This caused a huge backlash, and in 1984, Congress changed the rules to permanently basically put in the, in the laws today that mental muscular skeletal are part of the determination process. The reason I point this out is that as we go through looking at reforms, whatever we do has to be done in a gradual way. Uh, one, not to shock the system, not to shock beneficiaries, and also because Congress is not very good at dealing with shocks. They can do some things in the public as well that are modest and get us to reforms in the long run, but we can't just expect to solve this problem overnight. Uh, so again, so our reform ideas, uh, individual participants, employers, and a combination of the two. And again, our goals are to encourage work in some way, shape, or form, and labor force attachment, um, and also to change the public narrative. Uh, I think it's important to point out, because a lot of people talk today about the public perception. Um, Senator Hatch mentioned the idea that there's a substantial amount of fraud in the program. I guess it depends on what your word substantial is. Some people argue there's not much fraud at all. Um, and it's definitely not a big major part of the insolvency problem. But to the public, the perception that there's fraud in the program is a problem. And so we should basically also look to whatever reforms we do do, changing the perception so people don't view the program as all or nothing, that it's just disabled workers who can't work any longer. Uh, we want to change the incentives, we want to change the perceptions so the public has more support for the program as well. So we basically want to do pilot projects to test our reform ideas. For individuals, we would launch pilots offering partial disability payments. This would target both new and existing SSI beneficiaries who attempt work. These features would include voluntary participation for demonstrations. So it's important we, we basically not force people into this. As a researcher, and there's researchers out there who say, well, that's not a good control group, that's not a good experiment. We understand that, but we're not dealing with lab rats, we're dealing with people. Uh, so we want to make sure we do something that's voluntary so we encourage those who want to work to try work and not harm people. So in other words, we're trying to do no harm first. Uh, we basically would guarantee 50% of the monthly benefit, given earnings are below a threshold, then phase it out. The threshold could be, for example, $3,500 a month. It might be phased out again for a one for two. Uh, the benefit counseling would be provided. There's a lot of issues about how we would help people transition back to work. 
uh, what kind of work supports they need, what kind of benefits do they need in counseling. We need to provide that. Um, this would include health and career orientation and demonstrations. For the pilot projects, we want to get something on the employers. We like some ideas that have been tested and sort of written about by Jeff Liebman, Jack Smulligan, who's here as well, looking at pilot programs for partial and temporary, how we would engage employers. General idea is incentivize employers to take more responsibility for employee coverage, personal disability insurance. Uh, we want to get the employers more involved in this. Uh, these features would include things like voluntary participation, for, again, for demonstrations, uh, potentially a tax credit to offset against the premiums for private disability insurance coverage. If we did that, the credit could be up to a set amount. It would cover a two-year policy. We expect that those who did this would be on private DI for two years, and if they didn't return back to work, then they would transition on to um, the public disability insurance program. So part of the idea is to help people get off, but also help them stay attached to labor force and not get on the program in the first place. Um, the SSDI role, again, would have an exclusion period. So if you're covered by private DI for two years, you could not apply for the public DI program until after that two years was done. Um, we would integrate the handoff, so it's basically if you were on private DI and maintained on it, you would be transitioned seamlessly to public DI. You would not have to apply again. So we're not trying to make this a hard process. It would be in some ways seamless. And we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Now we're going to turn to Neil Jacobson, who will be talking with us from the dais. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Hi, I'm Stephanie. <clears throat> uh, exploring an alternate definition on disability. On behalf of my co-writers, Barbara Butts, Anita Aaron, Aya Ab Adabi, and myself, thank you for considering our paper regarding exploring an alternate definition of disability. I want to start by telling you a little about me, about me because I think it's relevant to our paper. In 2008, after 29 years of working for Wells Fargo as a disabled IT professional, I retired as a senior vice president to start a disability-focused employment company that specializes in consulting on staffing and placement issues. While at Wells Fargo, the project I was most proud of was the one where I designed and was responsible for the first 7x24 online banking system in the United States. My disability has always been very visible. I use a power wheelchair. My speech has always been impaired. I use a personal assistance services for many of my activities of daily living. In the 70s, shortly after starting work, I received a letter from Social Security telling me that I was no longer disabled. My friends quickly reassured me that I need not go through an identity crisis. My cerebral palsy remained intact, and it took me over five years to earn as much working as when I received government benefits. If I had needed as much assistance then as I do now, I could not have afforded, afforded to have gone to work. Changing the Social Security definition of disability is not a new idea. Our research revealed that in the 1950s, the founders of the Social Security Disability Program wrestled with the definition. The wrestling has continued for six decades. In 2006, the Social Security Advisory Board emphatically recommended the definition be changed. We suggest the new definition be, quote, a disability is a medical, medically determinable, determinable physical or mental impairments that has resulted in the substantial impediment to employment and is expected to result in death or has lasted or is expected to last for a continuous periods of at least 12 months, end quote. This definition is very similar to the current definition except there is no reference to the ability or inability to earn above a substantial gainful activity amount. With this new definition, the Social Security Disability Program can and should restructure itself. The restructured disability program should enable and encourage people with disabilities to seek assistance to stay at work as soon as impediments to employment due to disability appear. Hopefully, the concept of going out on disability will be eliminated. The newly structured Social Security Disability Program should put focus on coordinated employment services and must be much simpler to navigate than today's program. The definition will enable Social Security to set up a two-phase approach. Phase one enables beneficiaries to receive support services. People with disabilities should be eligible for phase one if they have the required number of Social Security work credits and if they have a disability as newly defined. 
and as soon as their disability imposes impediments to their employment. Phase 1 beneficiaries receive health care services and coordinated employment services as needed. People remain eligible for Phase 1 support services until they reach retirement age or are no longer disabled or no longer need or want the support, support services or die. Phase 2 enables beneficiaries to receive cash benefits. To be eligible for Phase 2, people with disabilities must be eligible for Phase 1. To begin receiving cash benefits and to avoid indu induced entry, applicants should be expected to earn below a given wage for a given amount of time. These cash benefits should be viewed as an offset to the high cost of disability. Our paper refers to studies documenting the cost of disability is high. You can also take it from me, having a disability is expensive. We recognize the need for an upper earning limit above which beneficiaries should be able to pay their own expenses. We suggest SSDI beneficiaries keep their full cash benefit until their total earnings plus stipend exceed 200 250% of the federal poverty level. After reaching that earning level, stipends will be reduced by $1 for every $3 earned. Earning will be reevaluated annually. Participants experiencing intermittent unemployment can request earning reevaluations more frequently. The emphasis of, re of the restructured SSDI program should be on providing coordinated employment services. Professional career coaches should work with beneficiaries to create, monitor, and maintain their individualized career plan, ICP. ICP should clearly outline tasks to be accomplished to stay at work or return to work. These tasks may include completing a rehabilitation program, finishing a school training or retraining program, assessing and modifying the workplace environment, obtaining benefit and financial planning services, acquiring self-employment and business startup services. There are many employment services available to people with disabilities today. We are not suggesting new services need to be developed. Today, however, there is a very complex, complicated maze that people with disabilities must go through to find, qualify for, and take advantage of these services. There is a dire need for beneficiaries to work with career co coaches and coordinate services. Social Security should take the lead and fund the full development and piloting of these restructured programs, including coordinated employment services. Social Security should administer coordinated employment services, outsourcing the work to local agencies. Social Security should also evaluate the effect effectiveness of pilots and modify the program as needed. In the development stage, a complete definition of coordinated employment services, as well as the roles and responsibilities of career coaches must be agreed upon. However, individualized career plans will be created, monitored, and maintained must also be decided. Consensus, consensus and cooperation from affected government agencies, the vocational rehab, rehabilitation community, the disability advocacy community, and the employer community must be obtained. In the development stage, federal waivers must be obtained and a cost-benefit analysis must be conducted. This analysis must determine what percent of beneficiaries must stay at work or return to work to ensure the program will be financially sustainable. The program should be piloted in three to five states, a complete evaluation should occur after the first five years and every three years after, thereafter. The program should be modified as lessons are learned from the evaluations. Here are some questions we receive most often. Will the proposed new Social Security definition of disability fix the near-term SSDI financial problem? No. How will beneficiaries who can't work be affected? They should experience no difference from today. Why now? 25 years after the ADA, there has been no significant employment improvement for people with disabilities. Every program, like every business, must periodically reinvent itself. The time for innovative change is now. Why will this work? We propose setting measure, measurable atta attainable employment goals based on consensus from affected communities and a cost-benefit analysis and pilot the program to determine the fe feasibility of reaching the goals. One of the most important things I've learned in my professional career and from being a person with a disability 
is that if you don't start, you certainly will never succeed, and you must always go, go, go. Um, thank you all. I intend to be fairly brief so that, the, to me, the most important part of the session uh, can occur, and that's your questions. We have uh, a great deal of expertise here. As a matter of fact, I was uh, speaking to someone about the devastation that would occur if there was a bomb here today. Uh, so to get going, in these um, three papers, there are some similar themes. Uh, a focus or re-emphasis on SSDI as a temporary income replacement um, program. Uh, different words may be used, but that's the theme. An emphasis on funding and doing continuing disability reviews. Uh, maintaining applicant ties to the workplace. And if that tie is lost, shorten the time to get back to work. Additionally, to allow beneficiaries to work without a limit on earnings as they improve or medically or vocationally. And of course, that's a, there are specific differences. Um, the need to pilot to create the final operational processes. Uh, most beneficiaries, the belief that most beneficiaries can work, especially with appropriate workplace accommodations and supports, and therefore focus on work capacity rather than incapacity. Nonetheless, there's some differences. Should some benefits be partial as well as temporary? Should the employer directly finance the first years of disability benefits? The impact of unemployment and other economic shocks on SSDI applicants and our program. Are all benefits temporary or just a small subset of benefits? And decision for placement in temp benefits, is that an appealable or a non-appealable decision? And then finally, should we modify the definition of disability that's served us, whether well or ill, for the last 60 plus years? From my perspective, um, I want to present to the authors some questions and cautions and reminders. And I'd love to hear their answer and your thoughts on the subject. Uh, my first, coming from my life in policy and in operational components, is never forget that there's very little similarity between program costs and administrative costs. Program costs are benefits. Administrative costs is what it costs Social Security to make these decisions. Um, saving program costs never increases administrative funds. Uh, there's no, oh boy, you save, you've saved uh, 10 million, I'm gonna give you five. Uh, you're going to have to think about a way to get appropriate funding to make these changes and then maintain the program. Uh, operational realities, and thankfully in the last program, and it was intimated here, please remember, keep it as simple as you can. Administratively simple programs can be funded and maintained a lot better than difficult funding programs. Um, and this is really towards you, Jason. When you're looking at temporary disability alternatives, do look at the five states that have them, as well as private and partner, uh, public partnerships. Uh, those states are Rhode, now there, Rhode Island, New Jersey, New York, California, and Hawaii. But like has been said before, they're different in each of those five states. Please use caution if you assume that the SSAA residual functional capacity decision is anything but magic. <clears throat> SSA creates it, you don't understand it, and SSA doesn't much understand it. Um, number two, if I'd have only known that there'd be more ODAR staff here, I probably would have dropped that bullet. But generally, <laughs> generally use some caution when you're assuming that the decision maker, there's, there's your politically correct way to go, when the decision maker will always be compliant with your policy. Uh, certainly care uh, must be taken when deciding what decisions are or are not appealable, and that's really to you, Kim. Uh, in my experience with Social Security, 
we have always had a goal of working collaboratively uh, and cooperatively with other agencies, but significant agent, interagency co cooperation um, happens more in the breach than in the main. Uh, SSA research, and this was mentioned, SSA research suggests that many be beneficiaries attempt a return to work but very few work for long and very few reach and maintain SGA. These papers appropriately assume beneficiary cooperation in medical vocation improvement efforts, but what if they don't? And that's been raised as well. Uh, what, what should we expect? Should we expect if therapy that includes major surgery uh, to improve medical function? Should the applicant be required to do that? And finally, while certainly bigger issues than only SSDI, perhaps the real issue is what should be the economic safety net for, the American, uh, for Americans? And one piece of that, going back to the very first bullet, is we're talking about SSDI, but should it also apply in some way to the SSI program? And my point is, if not, we'll have two different programs that now SSA is going to have to fund and administer, and that will raise a significant amount of complexity. At this point, let me start with you, Kim, and if you could respond, and we'll move right down, and then we'll be open for questions. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, um, Art, thank you very much for your commentary. Appreciate that. Um, just a couple of perspectives, and I encourage um, my co-authors to weigh in uh, as well. Um, in addition, our focus was very much on a, on a very particular subset of the population, that small set of, subset of beneficiaries who medically improve. I'll, I'll let my other colleagues kind of talk about their views, but, but we were very focused on that group of people, um, number one. Um, we also, um, uh, not only, um, in, in the, uh, another issue that Art brought up was administrative costs, and, and not just because I work there, but I, I would like to defend the Congress in the sense that I think Congress sometimes has stepped up, uh, particularly in the area of continuing disability reviews, um, provided additional funding. They do recognize um, the short-term um, expense that is needed in administrative costs for some long-term gains. And also, um, the Social Security Administration does have some uh, funding, mandatory funding, which is not subject to appropriation on certain demonstration projects. So I think, I think that there, yes, we need to be mindful, absolutely. But I, I do think that there also is a great deal of interest in the Congress and, and, and doing some of the, some of the right things. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention briefly was um, in terms of the um, SSI program, I agree. I did not mention our, pre our presentation, and I should have. Um, one of the things that we talk about in our program is that it could potentially apply to the SSA population as well. Thank you. Jason? So uh, first of all, Art, I want to thank you for the comments. Um, Art and I work together at the Social Security Administration. I've always had a policy crush on Art. Uh, <laughs> now, now it's in the open. Um, Art has always been one who's been open to other ideas and always given constructive feedback uh, where some ideas may have holes or failures in them and always trying to help improve people's ideas. Um, and, and I know you're sorely missed because you retired at SSA, but I want to thank you for the comments. Thank you. Um, to go to some of the first two bullets on this slide that Art mentioned, um, the research that's been done suggests that, again, people try to go back, return to work, uh, but they can't do it for long, they can't maintain SGA, and they fall back through. One of the things we have noticed in the research, uh, and again also in the perception of the program, is that it's considered to be all or nothing, and that DI has its viewpoint, disability, that it's a static. That once you become disabled, you're disabled forever. You never get undisabled. Again, one half of 1% then meet the medical improvements to go back to work. What we've noticed is that for a lot of issues, musculoskeletal, mental, and a few others, there could be medical improvement. But a lot of people are very scared after going through the application process just to get awards, and even trying to do it again and say, nope, I'm done, I'm going to try. All the reforms that we've talked about maintain attachment to the program. So if someone tries to go back to work, succeeds, fantastic. If they go back and then fall back into the program, we don't make them reapply, they maintain attachment. We also allow for the idea that realizing that disability can be very dynamic. Picture someone who has mental illness with the right workplace support. They may be able to work 10, 20 hours a week, or some weeks 40 for a long stretch but then have an episode that requires an employer who understands and has the support to say, we understand you're having issues now, you can go back on DI or some support and then come back to work when you're able. 
we don't have that capability now in a wholesale approach that we need to do. We need to change that both from the program perspective, structurally, and the public's perception. Um, I appreciate the comment about basically what we always call KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. We're trying. Um, <laughs> this is a very complex program. Uh, too often I've heard both on the retirement side and disability, you hear politicians say it's just a math problem. That belittles the complexity of the program and the interactions, and that's really misleading. It's a very complex program. Uh, there's a lot of subjectivity in who gets on the program. There's a lot of misunderstanding about how people get on, how they stay on the process. Uh, it is not simple. We need to try to simplify it as most as pos best as possible, and we're working towards it. It's always an issue in the back of our heads, and a lot of people who comment on the paper said, you might be making it more complex. How do you simplify it? We're keeping that in mind. Um, the other states with the partial yeah. disability, a lot of them incorporate also workers' compensation with that. And so it's a different, but we've looked at that and tried to figure out how we could do that holistically which kind of gets to my last point, which is Art's last bullet. Um, we're talking here about SSDI, the Disability Program, but we need to think a lot more holistically about the social safety net and reforms. Uh, changes to the retirement program will have an impact on the disability program, both the financing, those who apply when they get on it, the incentive structure, uh, the implications with, SS, uh, with SSI, uh, implications for Medicaid. Um, there are a lot of issues. We need to look at workers' compensation programs, unemployment insurance. How do we think holistically? And when Dr. Sullivan and I looked at this reform idea, our biggest concern, our biggest goal was to try to maintain labor force attachment. When I see people with visible disabilities who are working, you know, I always feel lazy. Uh, you know, because they're working so hard and they're staying attached. Uh, and nothing to us should be more morally responsible than helping those with able minds stay attached. There's a, a lot of pride people get from working. There's a lot of self-sufficiency. To let someone just waste away because we said they have a disability, I think is more reprehensible. And so all of our reforms were designed to encourage labor force attachment in any way we can and to get to the cost programs. Um, we had in mind that sometimes you have to spend money to save money. Um, and I'm not trying to use that as an excuse to increase the cost of the program. But there are sometimes that's money that's worth being spent. If we can help people in the short term return to work in the long term, that to me is money well spent. Thank you, Jason. Neil? Working for a bank? We're always, we're always looking at the ROI. We're always looking at the ROI. The reality is we want disabled pe people with disabilities. <laughs> The more, the more disabled people work, the better it is for the economy and for our program. Because we have no idea how they do how they do how do you yeah how many people have to go to work how to go have, have to, to have to go to work to make our program, to make our program sustainable, sustainable. Mm -hmm. also we, we have so many wonderful programs also, we have so many yeah. wonderful programs they are so complicated. that they're so complicated. They are so, uh, yeah. we, forgive me, but we spent more money on me on the complexity. We spend more money on the, on the complexity than we do on people. Than we do on people. Yeah. That's true. Thank you, Neil. We're going to turn now to questions. I hope you have them. I see hands up. We'll start with you, Lou. Lou Enoff, I worked at Social Security a number of years ago. And uh, the question I have is, does somebody have a magic bullet that is going to cause the different agencies to work together? Is there a program that we could use as a model? In 1985, I chaired a work group with HHS, Education, Labor, and Social Security. And we had some wonderful ideas. 
And they got to a point of trying to move them out, and it fell apart. Some of the ideas are here. By the way, thank you for a lot of great ideas. But getting them to work together, if somebody has that answer, uh, maybe, uh, maybe there could be a separate allocation of funds given to a czar or something like that. Like I don't like that. that. We are looking at career coaching. Of course. It's something somebody who knows how to kick butt. Somebody who knows how to kick butt. Would you would you believe that it was a career coach? It's what it is doesn't do. It's a death to them of the and we do believe with a career coach that if one agency is not doing an adequate job, we, they can go to another one. Yeah. Can I, can I add to something, yeah, Neil? Because Neil made a very good point about you need someone to kick butt. And uh, without putting names to the people in this room, that is a role in some ways for one, the Office of Management and Budget, which has both in its title management and budget. And nothing controls agency responses better than budget. Um, which also takes leadership from the president to say this is important to me, uh, and to tell the cabinet secretaries you shall work together. It also, and, and then it, in any administration, not yes, uh, sorry. sorry, that's right. Uh, the president is an institution. Uh, and it also takes Congress to do their other part of their job, which is oversight, and to literally make it an issue to have the cabinet secretaries come in and have hearings and expose and say, why aren't you doing this better? Unfortunately, sometimes performance review and government reform is not sexy, but it's very important. All these ideas we're talking about today um, won't work if we don't talk about implementation. Uh, so many good ideas in government get lost under implementation. Uh, and so, Lou, that's a very important point. We have to keep that in mind and find ways to get people to kick butt and force them to do it. I see a hand right here. When I went to discover how they do the critical work program, I discovered a surprise in Just toss it at her. She'll catch it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when I went to England to try and figure out about their Fit for Work program, I discovered that their um, equivalent of Social Security is under the Department of Labor. It's called the Ministry of Work and Pensions. And what that means is at the level of direct accountability to the president, there is a single person who is trying to assure the full employment of the workforce of the United Kingdom, whether they have a disability or not. And it has changed the accountability in dramatic ways. And when I, one of the things that makes me feel the most uncomfortable about Social Security disability is it was started as a way to more or less warehouse people with disabilities. And now with the Americans with Disabilities Act, we want people with disabilities fully participating in life and in the economy. So I would think that would be one way to really uh, encourage the collaboration across the agencies and accountability would be to move SSA into the Department of Labor. Did, did I see your hand, David? David, did I see your hand? No. Okay. Back in the back. Yep. So um, I think it was Neil's, Neil, your project that talked about redefining specifically the statutory definition. And I, I'm a, after seeing the federal government work at, for a while, it's very clear that they pay attention to statutory intent. And they'll have the statute, many of the agencies will have that statute right next to them as they implement and they try to do a very faithful job to, and I'm not an administrator, so do a faithful job to stick to the legislation. And I would urge to not use the term medical in the definition uh, or m retain the word medical, but use a, a term functional um, assessment or a functionally determinable uh, condition. Uh, and I would urge uh, that, you know, we've talked a little bit about around the edges, but uh, updating uh, the process of determination, updating the, jo the process of uh, evaluating jobs based on function, right, as opposed to some arbitrary, non-data-driven approach to defining what an occupation is and what its requirements are. And so I would really urge either Department of Labor or Social Security or both to update the definitions of occupation based on functions that are consistent with the determination process, because then we could marry together the employment services based on function and also eligibility for benefits based on, dollar benefits based on function. So just allow medicine 
to have a helpful hand from non-doctor people. Thank, thank you. Any comments before I move to the next question? That's a good comment. You, yeah. Bob Williams. Social Security. Bob Williams Social Security. There are about four million people with disabilities working today have Sixteen thousand and a third. Less than fifteen. <laughs> Improving their earnings power. Let me jump in, Bob. With some of the papers, though, I, I, I didn't see it either or. Some of the supports would certainly continue if needed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and Bob also, it's a great question. <laughs> but it is not
services and supports. Only there. It is. Equal opportunity. As well, there are about 4 million people with disabilities working today. Half of those make under 20,000 and a third less than 15. Why are we not focused on improving their earnings power? But it is not services and supports only. There it is equal opportunity as well. So I, I, I'm not going to, you're, you're exactly correct, Bob, I'm not going to get in an argument, but I think what I would like to point out is one of the things we didn't have a chance to mention because we only had 10 minutes was when Dr. Selgren and I do our paper, we talk about trying to integrate these forms with the ADA. Um, part of that is also access. And the one thing we don't mention, and I don't know how to address it, is sort of the bias perception against those with disabilities, where an employer might look and say, wow, I really don't want to take on this challenge where they could be losing on a really good employee. I don't know how to change that, but we're hoping that by doing partial and temporary, we allow those folks who are working, the four million who are working, but maybe aren't getting over $20,000 to be able to work and still get some Social Security benefit, again, a partial benefit, stay attached to labor force, still stay attached to the program in healthcare, which gives them some support to stay in the workforce and not be discouraged. It also gives employers through private disability insurance, hopefully more of an incentive to be able to take on people uh, to allow them to work and have the access. It's not a silver bullet, but that's how we're hoping this, this this reform would take place. Thank you, Jason. Far back. Sure. Dave Stapleton. So I now know it's harder to ask a question than it is to answer one. Um, the, uh, Kim, uh, I think uh, one way to describe the difference between your proposal and our proposal is you're providing temporary benefits and employment supports after people already get Correct. on the rolls, whereas we're doing that outside of SSA yep. before they get on the rolls. And uh, I'm wondering whether you would like to comment on the the uh, differences between doing that. And also, um, whether you, and, th and I think this also applies to you, Jason, uh, that uh, whether you see a need to change the medical definition, I'm sorry, the definition of disability in the law in order to support your proposals. Um, as, our, as our authors talked about the, 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 the premise of the paper itself, we were, we were very focused on the this, these MIE cases, the medical improvement expected cases, and we're very focused on them because we felt that they weren't really being treated compassionately under the existing program. You know, they, they, they don't know if a CDR is going to take place. They're not given services automatically along the way. And then at the end of the day, you know, if, they, if a CDR does take place, and for this population it's likely that it does, um, you know, they're, they're provided no supports if they leave the role. So that was why we focused on that particular population. As I listened to your, your support, I thought, you know, your, your proposal, certainly if that, if that were the case, it might obviously impact the number of people who would be in that category um, in, in the proposals that we're talking about. So yes, um, there is a, um, you know, some potential for synergy, synergy there. I, I, would, I would add, uh, Dave, that while we don't think we'd have to change the definition, the definition of disability, you could, you do have to change the law to allow for partial and temporary, which really don't allow for now. Uh, I'd also add just for the audience, when we were asked to do our papers, we were asked to focus, all of us, on our reform ideas, even though we realize that in some ways a lot of them are complementary and a lot of them are synergistic, and you could in some ways have like a buffet where you could pick and choose some and the best of some and put them together and actually have them combined. And one of the things we're hoping, and this is my plug to <coughs> CRFB if they're listening, is that when they put the book out, there is sort of a concluding chapter that says, hey, after we've talked to all the policy experts and all the folks who've given comments in the paper, Here's where we see the synergies to move forward. Because we try to do this in a nonpartisan way, but also realizing that a lot of different things could piece together to have help reform move forward. Pat, next, and sir, here, next after that. Pat, you next. Hi, Pat Owens again. Um, Kim. Yeah. Uh, I wondered if, if your proposal, and I think I missed one part of it, is medical care, you know, m medical recovery expected yeah. kind of indicates that there should be some sort of medical care going along and following that person. Did you have a provision for that um, uh, of, of some sort of, a, you know, following a medical plan or prescribed yes. treatment or? Yes. 
Yeah, our, our proposal gets to some, into some detail in terms of um, what happens through the, the CWICs and the services, that the, the action plan that they have to follow, both the medical and supports that are needed for them, employment supports as well. So we get into some of those details okay, specifically. Okay, because if they don't have you know, medical care course, coverage yes. and that sort of thing, that's an exactly. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I also wondered if you had thought about medical recovery expected folks asking the question, do you have private insurance? because I've always thought that if we knew if someone had private insurance when we're trying to work with them in, in Social Security that there might be a partnership that could develop there early on rather than later on. So I wondered if you thought of that. Yeah, we, not specifically, but we can certainly take a look at that before we finalize the paper. That is in Jason's work. Yeah. And, and, and part, I understood that too. Yeah, right. but, and part of this also, just to clarify, we need to change the framing of how we work with employers because sometimes for private disability they require beneficiary to keep applying over and over again no, for public. No, yeah, yeah, so exactly. I, I want to change the incentive structure so that it's helpful, not harmful. Yeah. Right here in the front. Um, I think Bob made a point that I think you all need to think about when you're exploring these in that when you're talking about moving people to work, are you moving them to jobs that will allow them, even with the employment supports, what about being able to pay their bills, to be able to rent an apartment, will going to work cost them their housing subsidy? Um, will it cost them their food subsidies? That, that a wage um, here in DC, if you're making $30,000, where are you gonna live? You know, and so are we gonna be forcing people? So while we're thinking about employment supports and and, and benefit supports, are we thinking about, are we moving that person to true independence, which is what the goal uh, is supposed to be? Are they gonna be able to live independently, take care of themselves independently? And if we're just thinking, get them a job, and not thinking about get them the ability to work and live independently, I think we're falling short of what the ideal is for the beneficiary, and that's the term we really ought to focus on, is the beneficiary benefiting. So can I, can I say a quick, of part, part of our reform idea is to realize that some people on disability benefits may not actually be ever able to get to full financial security, but they would still like to do some work, and we discourage that, we don't allow it, and that's problematic. So we have a, a two-fold approach. One is, for those who may be able to get back on track to full financial stability. We want to help them. For those that could do some work, but because of the cash cliff, the interaction with food stamps, rent support, everything else, they're saying this is too complicated. I'm afraid of losing my benefits. I'm not going to try. We're trying to protect that right to work. And I think that's the idea of our, our framework. We want to protect the right for people to work. And that could just be partial. Even partial work is still beneficial. Uh, and they keep support. So we want to make sure we have a tool, dual track. Great. We're thinking holistically. Yeah. You and questions. I are on the same. Yeah. Great questions. We've only got one, and Jack got my eye first, so we'll, we'll finish with you, Jack. But we're around. Don't be shy. Uh, so Jack Smulligan, um, question actually for Jason, and then if Kim could follow up. Um, the voluntary participation aspect of the pilot you describe, um, would that imply a lower eligibility standard? And if it wouldn't, what would be sort of the rational reason to choose a, a partial disability so benefit versus the full benefit? We, uh, as authors, uh, are under the assumption, and I don't like making policy by anecdote, um, but we are under the assumption that there is a good number, looking at the literature and some experience in other countries, that there is a, a significant amount of people who would like to choose work if they thought the program was beneficial to do so, and it's not now. Um, as a researcher who wants to do controlled experiments, you'd have to force them into it, but that, of course, would harm beneficiaries. So what we want to do is the voluntary would probably have less enrollment, so it wouldn't be a natural experiment, but it would allow us still to test the effectiveness of how people would actually want to do entry into a program if they thought the program was structured to help them work. Uh, and, that, and that's why we think the incentive is there. But we don't know how many to pick it up. That's why we want to do pilots to find Neil? out. Neil? One second. Can I add a comment about the definition of disability? Right now. Right now. Yeah. And the definition has a work. 
test. All you want to do is all you want to do is take out the work. All we want to do is take out that work test. I lied, someone begged, begged successfully and promised me twenty dollars at lunch, so whoever you are, you get it. So I'm gonna ask a question for him. Oh um, so as opposed to a blind kind of the bond type experimental test, is anybody doing uh, experiential studies uh, for to l actually look at people's time path as they process through and their experiences? Also, individuals. individuals, following individuals over time. And then would a panel of different disability types of SSDI beneficiaries really uh, be helpful here? Because you're, there's, there's a lot of talk of one size fits all. Thank you. Uh, well, again, we were, I was trying to make clear in my comments that one size does not fit all. Um, and so we do want to find out with our pilots what types of conditions might be more prone uh, to volunteering for types of partial or temporary disability. Uh, and that would be very helpful to actually have a better empirical study on what those conditions and those people might be. Thank you all, Mike.